inflammation or insulin resistance. We have these two really bad things, things that we shouldn't have high levels of. Certain levels of insulin resistance during exercise or certain kind of things can happen, but also certain levels of inflammation during certain periods can happen, right? It doesn't mean that they're always bad and always equal, but when they're in a chronic state, when we're always insulin resistant or we always have high levels of inflammation, they're both really bad. So is one worse than the other? Believe it or not, there is a lot more of this sort of coinciding effect that we don't always take into consideration. In fact, it's arguable that inflammation is why obesity leads to insulin resistance in the first place. There's a lot of argument out there that says like, oh, obesity triggers insulin resistance because of this, because we're eating too many carbs, or because of this. A lot of times it's the inflammatory response of obesity that leads to insulin resistance. So let's go ahead and break this down. You can save 25% off your order with Thrive Market if you use that link down below. So that's literally like your entire first grocery order. Thrive Market is an online grocery store that allows you to get your goods delivered to your doorstep. So you don't have to go to the grocery store. Okay, so that link down below is for 25% off. It's special for people that watch my videos, but you also get a free gift when you utilize that link as well. So whatever kind of diet you're doing, if you're trying to reduce sugar or you're doing paleo or AIP or vegan or vegetarian, it's all categorized by diet type, so it makes shopping an absolute breeze. Everything is in one spot, one-stop shop. Click a few buttons, boom, it's delivered to your doorstep within a couple of days. Makes it easy peasy, lemon squeezy. So that link down below in the description, 25% off again, off your first order plus a free gift when you use that link. So what ends up happening is with inflammation, when we have inflammation circulating because we're stressed or maybe we're even overtraining for too long or the more common one, you're obese, you have a lot of body fat on you, those pro-inflammatory signals, in this case specifically interleukin-6 and tumor necrosis factor alpha, these inflammatory signals, they change the insulin signal transduction. So what that means is they change how insulin really communicates with our cells. This is a huge, huge thing. Because if we understand that inflammation could be one of the roots to our insulin resistance, it might allow us to get by with eating possibly more carbohydrates as long as we're living an anti-inflammatory lifestyle. Now, I'm not jumping to conclusions and saying that wholeheartedly. It just means that if we adopt an anti-inflammatory lifestyle, we are really cutting the root of a lot of these problems, okay? So look at it like this, and I've talked about this in another video before. If you had a grocery store and that grocery store had a lot of different products on the shelves and people were buying these products and they were bringing them to the cashier and the cashier had their barcode scanner, they would scan the barcode and take your money and give you the product. Well, that's sort of like the glucose kind of insulin response, right? It's like you take the glucose from the person because insulin lets the cell door open, lets the cash, uh, cash register open, problem solved. Okay, well, when you have pro-inflammatory cytokines circulating all over the place, it's like they all of a sudden make it so that that barcode scanner can't really scan. It's like there's so much fuzz there that the barcode scanner can't scan. But there's a big problem that comes along with this too. It doesn't just stop people from being able to buy their groceries. There's another thing that's happening as a secondary effect. The grocery store is not able to call the trucking companies and not able to call the manufacturers to say, stop sending us product because we can't sell it. So what ends up happening is the trucks keep bringing product and the store keeps getting charged. What the heck's going on? So the store has to keep paying for all these costs of goods, but they can't actually sell anything because the barcode scanners aren't working and there's this massive disconnect and the stores are piled up with groceries that they can't sell and everything just goes to pot and gets bankrupt, right? This is essentially what's happening at sort of an insulin level within your body in a lot of ways. This communication is so disrupted by inflammation that insulin resistance develops and then it becomes worse. And then what happens with insulin resistance is then you have an increase in insulin levels that are circulating. Circulating insulin levels that are too high and are consistently high have an anti-lipolytic effect. This means that insulin will attach to a fat cell and it acts as sort of like a ball and chain on that fat cell that allows that fat cell to not get broken down into its fatty acid form. When you have fat on your body, it is stored in what is called a triglyceride. And a triglyceride is pretty simple. Just like the name implies, it is a tri, three fatty acids bound to a glycerol molecule. So three fats on a glycerol head, okay? 
Well, what happens is we require enzymes to break that triglyceride down into usable form so we can actually burn that fat. Well, what happens is insulin binds to that fat cell and it makes it so that fat cell cannot get broken down. So you're stuck with it. I mean, there's other ways it eventually can break down, but insulin resistance does make it harder to access your fat. The other downside is that that insulin resistance can also drive up a very interesting thing. It drives up gene expression for very specific de novo lipogenesis enzymes, driving up, driving up the enzyme activity or more enzymes. What that simply means is de novo lipogenesis is when we form new fat. Glucose that is excess doesn't always get stored as fat, but a lot of times it can be if it's excess. So when you have this glucose that is floating around because insulin is not able to open the cell doorway because your cells are insulin resistant. Remember, your cells don't want to respond to the insulin. They're resistant. So that means the glucose is still high. And that means the insulin is still high. So what ends up happening is that glucose has to go somewhere. So that glucose goes through de novo lipogenesis and turns into fat. But it gets turned into fat through these different enzymes. Well, it turns out that high levels of circulating insulin program our genes to produce more of those enzymes. So now we have more worker bees that are turning glucose into fat. So you can see how it's really a big problem. And then the more fat that we have, the more inflammation that we secrete. So this is a very, very important thing to note here, that if you can control inflammation, you can cut the cord on a lot of the issues with insulin resistance to begin with. Now, then you ask the question, how do you modulate inflammation? It's pretty simple, but it's not always easy. It's the healthier lifestyle things, right? It's making sure you're getting adequate protein, but not too much protein. It's making sure you're not having the refined carbohydrates as much. It's making sure you're not having a surplus of calories. One of the quickest ways to modulate inflammation is to be in a mild deficit. Again, it's not what people want to hear, and it's not always in line with the signals that our body is telling us, but eating in a deficit or perhaps intermittent fasting now and then is a great way to modulate inflammation. I don't want to get on my high horse and talk about the ketogenic diet and talk about intermittent fasting too much, but it is important to note that when you do abstain from food and you reduce calories, you reduce inflammation, okay? And thereby, you have indirect and direct ways where you can be controlling insulin resistance a little bit more. So if you look at intermittent fasting in general and you say maybe, okay, let's do uh, 16 hours of fasting where I skip breakfast three days a week. That alone is going to make it so that you're probably eating less on the days that you're fasting, just generally speaking. But given that length of time that you're having away from food, that can help restore some of that sensitivity to insulin in the first place. If you start restoring that sensitivity by taking a little break from food now and then, the cells now start developing an affinity for glucose again. They start understanding that, oh, this is a viable fuel source. And it starts communicating and it gets this feedback loop going. So this can be done multiple ways, but for me as someone that was overweight before, being able to just abstain from food a few days per week for you know, 16, 17, 18 hours, that was a much easier way for me than to just say count calories and try to reduce because I was always tempted by food. So it was easier to just black and white stay, stay away from it. And then when you look at the effect of fasting on an inflammatory response in the body, and if you fast for long enough and start producing ketones, that has a powerful effect when it comes down to what is called nuclear factor kappa B, as well as the NLRP3 inflammasome. Okay, so being able to modulate inflammation via this route could potentially, and I say this again with a grain of salt, have more flexibility with your diet because you're taking a break from food. That is rule number one. Okay, control the insulin resistance, control the inflammatory response a little bit by eating less and doing that however you need to. And then things might start to fall back into place. So as always, keep it locked in here on my channel, and I'll see you tomorrow.